And even though it is made entirely by the people that make barrel, uh, it is done with a different intention in mind. So it's like brought to you by barrel, but a very different, it's the adult swim of barrel, if you will. <laughs> Welcome into to another edition of the Hops and Spirits Bar Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Green, and we've got a big night for you. Tonight, it's another flight night, this time with Barrel Bourbon, who was our first flight night. We'll also be trying out their Stellum Spirits line as well. But before we get to that, don't forget, we're in the midst of Whiskey Weeks 2021, presented by Nose Your Bourbon, the original bourbon nosing kit. Uh, it contains 18 of the commonly found aromas in bourbon. And let me tell you, as someone that's still uh, new at this, although I've gotten a crash course uh, real fast uh, doing this podcast it has helped me a whole lot pick up those nuances just really uh, get get a whole lot better at this uh, you can check out their etsy store or go to nose your bourbon that's n-o-s-e noseyourbourbon.com for the nosing kit they got an expansion kit as well and some other goodies it's whiskey weeks presented by nose your bourbon and don't forget to check us out on all of our social media at hop spirits all one word on instagram facebook twitter tiktok and you can also check us out on YouTube and our brand new website, hopspirits.com, where we got all sorts of fun stuff. But we're here for flight night. It's our seventh one. I can't believe how fast these things are, are rolling by. And joining us tonight is Will Shragris. Did I say that right? Shragris, yeah, close. Shragris, okay. I, I see, you know no what, we practice. right, and I appreciate the effort. I, I, you know, I try it beforehand and I still screw it up. He's now the chief sales officer, chief product innovation officer. If you got some fancy titles now for Barrel Craft Spirits and Stellum Spirits, welcome in, Will. Thank you so much for having me back. It's, uh, I feel like, like everything in the past two years, it's either been a week or a decade, and I have no idea since I was here last time. <laughs> but it's so great to see all of you again. And, and our crew is back. We have Ariella or A, also known as Influ- Influenski on Instagram. Hey y'all, welcome welcome back and glad to be here tonight or afternoon or morning, whatever. <laughs> Whenever you're listening. And we also yeah. have Chris, who's better known as Jeff the Rabbit, which is the name of his rabbit. Chris, welcome back. Howdy, howdy. Hey, glad to be here. Appreciate y'all having us on. And then unfortunately, D. Damon, VA Bourbon Hunter, is not able to join us tonight, uh, but he will be back soon. So uh, keep an eye out on our next flight night. But we're here talking with Will as part of Whiskey Weeks, and what better way to talk about whiskey than to actually try some whiskey on the show? And and Will, what, what's first up for us? So I think the first thing we're going to have is Stellum Bourbon, which I guess I happen to have a bottle right here, even though it's not open. I'm drinking a different bottle. <laughs> uh, and I can talk about it, but you know, all of you drink a lot of whiskey, so please cut me off at any point because I want to say the things that you and and your listeners want to hear. Uh, but Stellum Bourbon is a reasonably new offering for us. We launched the brand Stellum in late March, early April. And even though it is made entirely by the people that make barrel, uh, it is done with a different intention in mind. So it's like brought to you by barrel, but a very different, it's the adult swim of barrel, if you will. (laughs) Uh, I, I like that analogy because uh, it comes in at a lower price point. And a I, bit. I, yeah, I just came up with that. So it's going to get used again, but you'll know you're the first. Um, <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, Barrel, the, the idea behind Stellum from Barrel was uh, we had been working with so many sources for so long. And about two years ago, uh, we hit this moment with Barrel Craft Spirits where we were getting asked by our distributors and pretty major customers for a thing that never changed. Not, not only didn't change in its label, but also proof UPC, brand registration, state registration, COLA registration, all the like dumb logistical things that, that happen between blending a whiskey and selling a whiskey. And our roots as a company with Barrel Craft Spirits are, we only care about making the best thing we can at any moment. And we're not worried about ever making the same thing twice. And that was antithetical to barrel. So we started developing this whiskey uh, using five ingredients that we had really good stocks on and also stocks behind it. So like the same recipe, but younger. Uh, And up until about a little more than a year ago, then we kind of thought it would be an expression of barrel craft spirits that came out and a like, finally lower cost 
thing in Beryl. Uh, and we had this amazing meeting with Joe Beatrice, the owner and founder of Beryl, where we were sitting there and he said, whatever we do with this, because we had so many barrels lined up, we had done so many tests to get it blended. We were so happy with it. It's like, whatever we do, we're not naming it after some dumb white guy from like the early 20th century. And we like <laughs> said it as a joke. And we had this moment that was like, we have an opportunity here with a product and a distribution network and a sourcing network this doesn't have to be a barrel product. Like this can be its own brand and it can be like scary to the powers that be in the whiskey industry. Uh, and so we decided to create a brand that was completely forward thinking. Like there's no, we didn't find the recipe in anyone's boot. No one in our company owns horses. No one came from a distilling background. Like it is all people that have been working for barrel for the past three or four or five or six or seven or eight years with Joe. Uh, but we were making a consistent product and we wanted to launch a brand that was acknowledging that the people that drink bourbon and rye, but especially bourbon in America are not the same people that drank bourbon in the 1940s. Uh, and so we like are really dedicated to this being a classic bourbon pr profile, but still cask strength. Cause that's what we like to do and what we do best. Uh, but not trying to push the envelope on blending in a experimental way, the way barrel does. Instead, we're just trying to be like really, really good bourbon and acknowledging that like you can be a bourbon drinker that watches the Mandalorian and like thinks it's okay for gay people to get married. And like all of those things that are like being a real American that the bourbon world doesn't necessarily acknowledge. Uh, and here we are with barrel and it's like five months later. And we, we like as Stellum, don't even know what we have launched in some ways because it's been so successful. We're in, we plan to go to 46 States in the first year, but it's selling out so quickly that we like, can't, we, we are making sure that we have stock in all the States that we launched. We've already exceeded our sales goals or expectations by more than a million dollars for the brand for the first year. Oh, wow. uh, oh. We're wow. getting like, what is amazing to me is someone who has to deal with the boring sales side. And then also the really fun product development side is we get, such exciting feedback from the whiskey nerds that I want to talk to about the bourbon or the rye being really good. Um, and then we get really good feedback from the like safe ways of the world being like, this is selling off the shelf. Like this is resonating with people. Uh, and there's a uh, really like, there's a romance to both those things for me. Um, so sorry, I feel like that was kind of conceited, but <laughs> I've been really excited to talk to you guys about it. Cause I feel like you're like real people drinking bourbon in the industry. Um, I'm really excited to hear what you think about it. The five ingredients, just because our company is really based on being not only transparent about what's in the bourbon, but also transparent about what we can and can't tell you. There's three ingredients that all come from Indiana, from a distillery that you all know, but I'm not going to say it out loud. Mm. Uh, it's the 36% rye bourbon mash bill, the 21% rye bourbon mash bill, and then the 99% corn, 1% malted barley mash bill, which is like the redheaded stepchild of the production out of Indiana because it is a very one dimensional whiskey, but it brings that like mid palate. We call it the dad bod of the whiskey. Uh, it's mm. like, it's very one dimensional, but it's like corn forward and opulent and creamy. Uh, and then there's uh, one distillery in Kentucky and one distillery in Tennessee. So it's a five to 16 year old blend that goes into Stellum and it's at 114.98 proof. Yeah. And that'll be the lowest one we, we try tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned it's going to be like uh, just a question in terms of a consistency. Um, how do you, how are you going to keep that consistency profile with the different batches? Cause it's not a batch, right? I was reading and doing a, a little bit of homework mm -hmm. uh, that is, there's like a daisy chain blending. So can you just kind of tell us kind of how, you know, like how, how is it going to be a consistent bourbon? Just yes. because it's also cash strength. So. So, you know, the term daisy chain blending is like a very shorthand. It's not like part of the branding of the, of Stellum, but uh, the way that we do it is we have two separate 5,000 gallon tanks. And we make a blend that goes up to essentially that level for Stellum, but we don't bottle all of it. We use some of it as a base to be able to nail the proof and the flavor profile again. But rather than just trying to blend into those two tanks separately, 
we do sub blends where we worry only about the flavor profile. We don't worry about the proof. And so some of them come in too high and some of them come in too low. And from those, we formulate a blend that will be the right flavor profile and the right proof, along with a large portion of the last blend that is the right proof. So we don't have to adjust it as much. And then we wind oh. up with a bunch of ingredients that taste the right way, but aren't the right proof. And we vat them and we get a thing that is close, but not exact to use as an ingredient the next time. And so the, the reason we've started calling it a daisy chain blend is because of like the daisy chain bracelets that people make of like, they're all connected, mm -hmm. but it's, it's more as a way it's every time. It's not that it's like a starter. It's not like a sour mash kind of situation. It's just a way of helping ourselves out the next time that if we have a portion of it that's at the right proof, we don't have to worry as much about getting the proof correct. Um, and for a long time, we thought the proof will never change. And more and more what we're thinking is at some point we might have to change the proof a little bit because we're still really dedicated to like, this is gonna be the best whiskey we can make no matter what. But we've been able to do it a bunch of times now. So we may never change the proof or we might have to change it at some point because of availability of barrels and or a lot of things are yielding different proofs than we thought. Uh, but that that is like the idea of daisy chain blending has to do with uh, not using everything so that you've got a critical mass of thing that is the right whiskey, if you will. Well, I, I, I've, I've, there's nothing I've had from y'all that I, I haven't enjoyed yet. And then, I mean, I've had a bunch of the different batches and this is another one that's just, it's smooth, it's good. And I don't know, I don't know what to, I, I sometimes don't know what to say it, uh, on these. <laughs> I like the bottle. It's like very, uh, very mysterious. Like the label, it's like that dark blue with the mm -hmm. kind of like very uh, simple lettering. It's very different than a lot of like bourbon bottles out there. Well, and I was gonna yeah. say very skinny and and yeah, uh, the um, label is very neat actually. Very because a, it means stars, right? Stellium. Uh, yeah, it's like a bastardization of stellar or stellium, which would be stars or of the sky or celestial and in, in Latin. Um, and we really wanted it to be pretty minimalist. We wanted to we wanted to be a well executed simple bourbon brand for the twenty first century. I think that is the that is the elevator marketing pitch of what we're trying to do. It's it's just kind of hard to have that grandiose an idea year one, and so we don't say that all the time. But that is that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we want, however many years from now, people to talk about Stellum in the category that they talk about all of the major bourbon producers. Uh, uh. And so with Barrel, what we decided by splitting the two brands was. We want people to talk about barrel as always being cutting edge, but it's hard to be a standard and be cutting edge at the same time. And so Stellum is the, is the blend for us and the, and this brand for us and the whiskey for us that like, we want to be people's standard whiskey with Stellum. And we want to be people's exciting exploratory whiskey with barrel. It's very easy to drink yeah. for the proof. Uh, dangerously easy. Yeah. yeah. Very smooth. I like the, I like the definitely get corn though. I like the sweetness for sure. Yeah, yeah. I get some spice too. Um, like a lot of spice actually, but, but it's very easy to drink, like superbly easy to drink. The, the heat lingers throughout, but it's so easy to drink. Um, the texture, I would say somewhat in a thin to medium, it's not too oily. But this is a dangerous whiskey because you could just like pour it and you're like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, not that I'm trying to get anyone <laughs> saucy, but like it is a, you don't notice that it's overproof if you're not thinking about it. No. Um, and it, it makes for, because of that, really good stirred drinks um, that it doesn't throw off the balance of like a Boulevardier or a Manhattan. Uh, and I know we're going to try the rye next. And I actually, the rye to me is really the cocktailing of the two because it, it has a twang to it that lends itself to cocktails. But I, I find with the Stellum bourbon, uh, if you're using good ingredients, you don't have to do a lot to it if you're trying to make cocktails. Uh, you don't have to hide it behind anything because it's, it packs so much flavor. But it, like you said, it's pretty easy to drink for its proof. 
Well, and, and I think back to our, our first conversation, you're, you're talking about how the, the two brands differ. You know, you, you mentioned with Barrel Craft, it's really hard to compete with people making $40, $30, you know, blends with what you guys were trying to do. So that's why you guys have kind of went with that higher price point. Mm-hmm. Is this something that, that is more like akin to the common man approach and that's kind of what you're going for? Because you kind of touched on that, that you want this to be the, the go-to almost every day and then, you know, maybe special occasions or the, when you up, want to up the ante, you go to Barrel Craft. Yeah, so Stellum is uh, $54.99 on the shelf or $55 on the shelf. And so I want to be very clear that that is still a lot of money. And I, I don't want to pretend that that's an everyday drinker for everyone. But what has one of the many things, I feel like you hear me say this all the time, that's been really amazing about working for Joe, the owner and founder of Barrel, is that he really wants to hear about the details of what everyone in the company is learning in the market and what everyone in the company thinks is important about our brand and the whiskey world in general. And in the past four or five years, the difference between 55 and 80 has, is really important to me personally. And I feel like really important to a lot of people. $55 yeah. is not a cheap whiskey, but $55 to us was a, a pocket in the whiskey world where there were a lot of people selling $28 bourbon for $55 but there weren't very many people selling $70 bourbon for $55. And so we, in putting this together and targeted sounds too aggressive, but we targeted a price point that we felt like we could do the best thing on the shelf at that price. And so my conceited elevator pitch is Stellum is not the best deal in bourbon, but it is the best $55 bottle of bourbon. Um, There are some 20, $30 $30 bottles of bourbon that are fantastic. And there's some $70 bottles of bourbon that are fantastic. And I would argue that barrel is, you know, a $90 bottle of bourbon. That's fantastic. But uh, we really have, we've found success in barrel because we feel like we've been really dedicated to over delivering at the price point, And we wanted to do the same thing with Stellum. And when you are not a debts paid entrenched distillery owning Rick house owning company, you're not going to outdo the, the wonderful classics at 25 or $30. And, and I'm not hating on those brands. Those brands are great. Um, but we did feel like we can have an attention to detail in, at 55 that a lot of other people didn't have. And that, that was the impetus behind how Stellum wound up being where it was on the shelf, that we had enough room margin-wise to make the whiskey as good as we could. And we also felt like there wasn't a lot in the market that was doing what we felt like we could at that price point. Well, I enjoy it. I mean, that, that was very, that went down dangerously quick. <laughs> yeah. It's, especially for 55 bucks, sign me up all day long. Yeah. I was just thinking, it's like, what other bottles are around 55 bucks that are that good? Like in terms of like classic bourbon profile, like that we're always looking for vanilla, cinnamon, oak, and it just goes down, you know, pretty smooth for the proof, which is great. Thank you. Making it then, easy for me to drink too. <laughs> and then the second one we have tonight is the the rye, and that is that just straight from Indiana. Uh, so the rye is also an Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee blend. Okay. Even more so than the bourbon, it relies on Indiana. Okay. Uh, the major component is the ninety-five-five rye mash bill out of Indiana, but there's also the fifty-one yeah. percent rye mash bill out of Indiana. Um, it smells very familiar. And so. Smells- the the goal of the or so the, the the impetus the target on the board while we were working on the first blends of the rye was give all the rye drinkers what they want on the nose yep. and then make it a whiskey that everyone likes those were like the two things that Stella and rye wanted to be because there's ryes that are so twangy so herbaceous and like on the nose, it, it gives everyone who would like rye, but then it's, it's too abrasive for someone who just wants a whiskey. Um, and I feel like that is a little bit, th- that's one of the two tragedies of American rye for me. That and also that rye distillate is beautiful and people just over oak it all the time. Um, and so 
putting some of the more malt forward 51% rye in it, and then putting some of the more Kentucky style rye, the like more corn forward, more opulent, more caramely rye, uh, and a little bit of the more fruit forward Tennessee rye, where, which is not really a style that people think about, but it's a style that we have a lot of barrels from. Uh, the hope was that the people that are 95.5 chasers, that are Willet fans, that are Redemption fans, they, they smell this and they know it's what they like, but then it's just a little bit more interesting. That's why I say, wow, it smells very familiar. It's like that rye spice with like menthol, mint, like lots of green apple. It's very nice. For it's me, nice it's, rye. it's, I really like that it stays in the minty and the eucalyptus camp and it doesn't go into the dill camp very much. Um, that it's a, it's a, a fresher style of herba herbaceousness that I really enjoy. That's nice. What are you picking up there, Chris? Uh, definitely mint, for sure. Very, very sweet to, to me. Yes, sweet. Like brown sugar, mm -hmm. but also kind of oaky. It's very nice, like minty rye with lots of green and sugar. Yeah, I don't, I don't get a whole lot of oak, but ju just a smidge. Oh, this is a nice rye. I, I've been in a rye kick recently and mm. this is a nice smell and the, the, the taste, like the palate is just nice. Yeah, that wasn't what I was I expecting. I drink this. I drink this. <laughs> That's the best thing you can hear from someone when they're interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely don't want to hear, I don't know about that. <laughs> when, when someone says nice things and they don't have any questions, you're like, cool, I'll stay on for as long as you want. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Wow, that is nice. It's uh, would be good like with ice in the summer as like a porch. Like, what's the what's the proof on this? It's like really, oh, it's uh, 116. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, what's the age on the rye? Uh, so the youngest barrel in it is 14, or sorry, four, and the oldest is 10. It's mostly a, a five to seven year old blend. Okay. Uh, in order to nail the proof with both. Stellum bourbon and Stellum rye, we don't put an age statement on it because we want to be able to use four-year-old barrels if we need the proof from them. But mm -hmm. the youngest in any of the blends right now is five. Oh, wow, this is $55? Yep, same price. Wow. I just kept thinking about my favorite rye, which is at that $50, and this is really good. Like, this could be like a staple for me. In oh, terms of rye, cheers. yeah, cheers. Yeah, I need this in Virginia. We are working on it. Yeah, gotta, Virginia gotta... has actually been very good to our company in the past couple of years, but it we have to do about a year of like we can show that people want it before we can really go to Virginia with products. And so, uh, I know Dovetail went into Virginia pretty recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and seagrass is going into Virginia, which we're about to taste pretty soon. Yep. Uh, and and we hope Stellum will be there next year. But uh, Virginia is pretty deliberate with what they choose to allow in in a major way. Um, and and we respect that because they have a, a good process. Uh, as state controlled liquor boards go, if you have a question, if you think that something is going to be exciting and you want the state to do a one time buy, they they pick up the phone, they answer their email. They're just tough. Uh, they they don't they don't believe you if you say it's cool. You have to show them it's been cool in other places <laughs> for like a year. Yeah. Well, Christian, you're just gonna have to come to Kentucky again and pick up some bottles. I'm on the way. <laughs> well, I was gonna say we, we were talking before you know we hit the record button, and I can see why you know you, you get some some f certain feedback from folks saying that this might be their favorite of, of the two. Um, just because it, it is very flavorful. And to me, I think what I always enjoy about y'all is there's always a hint of like fruit, fruit forwardness in a lot of things. And that's perfect for me. Um, I, I kind of like that sweet with sweet side to, to everything. And uh, yeah, this is really nice. I think that uh, Joe and then Trip, who's the master blender in the company or the chief whiskey scientist is what we call him now. Uh, 
they've been really good about having all the different things that we develop have their own identity, but also there's a little bit of a house style that they, they both like high proof, easy drinking things. And because of that, a lot of the blends that we make have a little bit more fruit forwardness and they're a little bit more forgiving at a high proof than uh, a lot of the other things on the market. And, and, but also at a high proof, you have a lot, you have a lot of flavor. Um, and I really, being a person that didn't come out of the whiskey industry, I came out of like beer, wine, other spirit, like rum agricole, all sorts of fermented and or nerdy distillate things. Uh, trip is so good at like the step one is like, do I want to drink a lot of this? Like, what's the thing about this that's exciting and let's build off that. And he, he stays in this, the industry is, is like, you need to have people want to drink it. Mm. Uh, and I think that has made, that has kept focus on, we don't want to make things that are interesting and you have a couple of sips and you leave it on the shelf. We want to make things that are your favorite whiskey. Uh, and and it, it has kept us in line a little bit as we've developed stranger and stranger things in the barrel world. And as in Stellum, we like, we're really dedicated to having classic styles at high proofs uh, that it still needs to be something that you want to go back to every day or every yeah. week or for your cocktails instead of, oh, this was cool and I want to leave it on the shelf. Um, and it's been that voice on the blending team has been really important to us uh, in, for the success of the company as a whole. Uh, someone saying like, good whiskey is whiskey you want to drink. Uh, and it's not, it's not, that's not my background. That's Tripp's background. Well, and, and I'll say anytime I've had a friend come over and try these, they are always amazed when I tell them how high of proof they are because they are so smooth. I mean, the dovetail comes in at what, 124, something like that. Yeah. And my, my, my buddy was like, that's just dessert in a cup. Like, like you're in a glass. Like, and I was like, well, yeah, you better not have too much dessert or you'll <laughs> you'll be in trouble. Uh, but, but, you know, like, I mean, but that's kind of what they all are. I mean, you almost have to watch yourself in a good way because they are so drinkable. I get ready for the last one. We're going to try that because it's the most dangerous of the three. Uh oh, I'm intrigued now. I'm so intrigued. Shall we go to it? I, yeah. So yeah, so, I've just started seeing some of this pop up in Virginia. So. It's actually uh, September first it launched in Virginia. So. Wow. Oh, I've, I've just yeah. seen it on Instagram. I have I haven't seen it in ABC stores, but I've been, I've been seeing some people getting them. So. I, I've been excited since you told us back in January. We were one of the first ones to know that this was coming. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just waited because I was like, well, I mean, I, I know I could probably get a sample, but I, I want to enjoy it with, <laughs> with some people. So this worked out perfect. <laughs> I'm so glad. So seagrass, like Dovetail, is a blend of three different whiskeys. Uh, it's three different rye blends that we make that are all finished or, or matured secondarily in different casks. We produce the base whiskeys separately, and then we finish them separately, and then we blend them. The first and the driving force behind it is a Canadian rye that is finished in apricot brandy casks. Uh, and that is to me like the, the thing that is special about seagrass, even though the other two ingredients are difficult to make, they are supporting actors to the Canadian rye finished in apricot brandy. The second is a uh, Indiana rye so the 95.5 blend, different ages, but mostly the Indiana, but mostly 95.5 that's finished in Momsey Madeira. Uh, and Momsey is the uh, sort of second sweetest of the Madeira styles. So it's not a, it's still a pretty acidic wine, but it's a pretty sweet opulent wine as well. Uh, and the third is a, a Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana rye blend. So like an all America rye blend, similar to some of our batches of rye uh, that's finished in rum agricole or Martinique rum casks. And that gives a like very herbaceous, fresh sugar caney, grassy note to it. I just want to know how Trip oh, comes wow. up with this. Like, <laughs> how does his mind work that he's like, let me put this and this and this and that. And then it, 
because also if I'm remembering correctly, was it the seagrass that one of these is one of these barrels you y'all are the most you, you're like the number one buyer of, or was that the uh, that's the Armida, the, Armida, Armida. Armida. Oh, the, Armida. the pair, the pair, of pair. Me, but uh, yeah. actually, uh, not to take anything away from Trip because he does a lot of the work with this, but the arbiter of seagrass is a woman that's on the blending team named Nick Christensen, okay. who started as a single barrel manager, but uh, she's a hundred percent as important on the blending team as anyone. Um, I was going to say, as soon as you said woman, I was like, that's got to be Nick. And And I've seen a a lot of good things from her. uh, What Nick is so good about is Nick was in cocktails and Nick was in wine and Nick, but she was in Kentucky. So still very whiskey based. And so what makes seagrass special to me is not the heavy handed opulence of it because it is like a sweet, delicious rye. It's the playfulness on the palate that you get. It's the way that the nose is different from the front palate and the way that the rye evolves on your palate. And Nick is really like, she is the master of that. That the thing about seagrass that makes me love it and makes the sales, it's really the thing that like everyone in our company is drinking right now is that on the nose, it smells like a rye that's probably finished in something like a like very sweet, opulent rye. There's a lot of them on the market. And on the front palate, you get a lot of heat right up front. It's like spicy and Canadian and Indiana rye. It's like hot rye. And then everything falls away for a second. And you have this moment that I like to think of as like the zero gravity moment where you just only get apricot for like two seconds. And then it rushes back and you have a high proof rye again. And it's like this ability to go from rye whiskey to easy to drink, delicious tropical apricot, and then back to whiskey again is, I don't know how Nick is able to get that done every time because I've tried blends that she's made that taste right, but don't do that. And she makes sure that happens with every time they put it together. The, the mad scientist at work. Yeah. <laughs> Not mad scientist, well, smart like, scientist. Yeah. No, that is a delicious rye. That is very unique. Oh, wow. You know yeah. what it reminds me of? It, now it makes sense with the cocktail background. It seriously is like a tropical drink, like tropical cocktail. Yeah. yeah. And like, uh, when we first started launching it, everyone on, on that works whoa. in the market, we all were saying like seagrass sours. That's what we want. We want like lime juice, a sweetener, a seagrass. And we still like that. But pretty recently, someone was like, I just had seagrass and tonic water and it was delicious. And now everyone on the sales team is just drinking seagrass and tonic all the time uh, because it like just functions as this like delicious, tropical, slightly less oaky style of whiskey. Yeah. This is interesting. Wow. This is just rye. Wow. It's really impressive. Like, I mean, sweet throughout, but it's tastes like a cup drink like a you know like yeah. a stiff cocktail drink like you could just shake cocktail. it with ice and then just pour it. it's like here here we go <laughs> well especially coming off the the stuff you know the stellum rye and then going to another rye yeah they, they don't taste the same at all and, that, and i mean that in a good way and it goes back to like when we did dovetail in our, our media you know there's a little bit of a roller coaster ride and it's kind of fun you know to let, let your taste buds kind of pick up those complex flavors as you know it changes from one to the next um and like i really like this sorry go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. no no you go oh no it's just thinking like this is seriously transporting me to like a beach or like a tropical paradise right now and not very many whiskey can do that and this is an experience in itself to just be drinking this so thank you of course and when we were developing seagrass it was last summer And both Armida and Dovetail, the whiskey came first and the name and the branding around it came second. And even though we didn't really, we didn't realize how cool Seagrass was going to be when we developed it conceptually, the impetus behind it was in the pandemic, Joe and I were both at the same time for about two weeks in Northeastern coastal places. And we were both really like wishing we could 
go to like Florida or the Caribbean and we couldn't. And we had this idea of like, what's a whiskey that works in a brooding, rainy, cold coastal place and also in a tropical place. And so we wanted like this tough rye that you could have on the rocks sitting inside, like watching it rain on the beach, which is beautiful, but not tropical or also could work as a tropical drink that you could have with soda or like, you know, like a, a quick drink on your way out to the beach or whatever it was. Uh, and so we had this idea of putting really tropical grassy flavors into a high proof, really serious rye. And so actually like the, the concept and the name seagrass came before the whiskey. It's the only time we've ever done that. Uh, and then we spent like five months trying to like figure out how to make that a thing. Hmm. Oh, wow. That is interesting. Well, I, I think you nailed, nailed it on that. Like how, how hard is it for, for y'all? Cause like when you're, you know, you mentioned Nick being able to hit it, hit this, the spot every time with that kind of flavor profile, but when you're doing stuff like this, that are coming from three different types of finishes, you know, this, this one, the R media, the dovetail, how difficult is it to do that? Cause I mean, and, and then still also make big enough batches cause you guys want to be in what 40, 50 States with these as mm -hmm. well. Um, I mean, it is very difficult except that you learn a lot of lessons on the way to make it easier for yourself. And the major thing that is different about the way we put dovetail Arbita seagrass together is we are not producing the three ingredients to be good whiskey. We're producing the three ingredients to be the right ingredients for the final blend. And even though it is an extra step in blending that is a time suck and a money suck and a space suck and all of that, uh, it is also an extra step in being able to execute correctly. So if we can execute three different ingredients and get them very close to what we know we need, it allows us to then make the final product consistent because we have done the work one step beforehand. I don't know if we would be able to do a single finish 5,000 case blend that is the same all the time, but if the finishes are, are being used to execute a specific structural or flavor element, it gives us some leeway in what they are. We don't have to worry so much about getting the proof right in any one of the three ingredients so long as they... Yeah, but by, by, by the end, you, know, like, you, um, you got wiggle room. You got wiggle room. You, you and, got... and in a moment where we get the flavor profile right, but it's too tannic, we can then use something that is less tannic at the end to, to blend it out. All of, the, all of the things that... More ingredients make it harder, but in some ways they make it easier if from the very beginning you have a plan. And so dovetail our meat and seagrass, the, the trick to them, not to give away the house with our company, but the trick is it's not about figuring it out the whole time. It's about having a very specific thing that you need to make at each step so that at the end it's possible. Uh, but we're only able to do that because we control our own facility. We control our own barrels. We, can, we have like a whole section of our company that's about finishing and wood management. We, we are very careful about distillate and vatting distillate and keeping things in stainless steel when they're what we need them to be. Uh, there's a lot of process that goes into creating a spice rack that allows us to do what we want to do. I was going to say, you got, you got a lot of tools in the, in the tool cabinet to, to come up with some, some fun stuff. And you know, I, I feel bad for D. I know he's going to enjoy these at some point, but these are like right up his alley in terms of the high proof. And, oh, yeah. And, 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 and I, I get... I guess for me too is, um, what what is it that you, know, you talk about Trip and, and uh, Joe? Wh why do they like the high proof so much? Because pretty much everything is, but it's very drinkable. You know, you talk about that a lot. But why why kind of do they go that way when some try to go more at that 80, 85, maybe even ninety as an introductory? But mm -hmm. you guys are always well above that. So Joe's favorite whiskey to drink before he owned the company was tasting barrel samples in Kentucky. He worked in marketing and internet solutions and had worked with a lot of whiskey companies before. And he just really liked doing barrel samples and trips a distiller. He's around whiskey all the time. When you're tasting things off the still, they're a lot hotter than these. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the DNA of our company was very cask strength driven. Uh, and also I think that as Joe was de developing what barrel is spiritually, the idea of like whiskey people in America can handle it mm -hmm. was not something that people really acknowledged before. It was like Brooker's antique collection barrel. That's kind of, that was the American whiskey landscape for cask strength when, when the company first started. Uh, there were a couple other little random things, but those were the three sort of national releases that existed. Now there's barrel strength everywhere. But the difference for us is we want to make palatable barrel strength, like barrel strength. We want to make things that are designed to be in balance at barrel strength, rather than having the barrel strength be like a premium out of balance offering for the other things that we make. Uh, but a lot of it just comes from the, the our company is about a little under 40 people now, which is crazy for us because we were three in 2016, four. Um, but everyone who was here when we were developing these whiskeys at first is still at the company. And like, that's, that's what Joe loved. And that's what Trip loved with him. And that's what I loved signing on to like representing them. And it just like, it has be, it has continued to be the identity of the company. And when we were developing Stellum, we thought about, should we pick a proof and knock it down? And just like, we didn't like it. Not to say we won't do it at some point, but like we we just uh, we wanted to make the best whiskey we could, and to us, the best whiskey is still cask strength. Well, and I mean, I, that's I, music to my ears. Cask strength. I love I mean, it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I was gonna say. Two, two. You know, the, depending on how you're, if you're watching this, you know, the the two at the corners here, you know, A and Chris, and if D was on here, that's that's their thing, and I, I've just learned to love it because that's. I swear what everything I get anymore is um, I, I dove into the deep end uh, before I could really swim uh, when it came to tasting bourbons. Uh, but, but you guys just make them very approachable. I mean, it's a very, it's weird to say at a high proof, but I feel like anyone could drink it and enjoy it. You know what I mean? It's not, it, it, they drink in a sense much lower because as we're talking, like you can almost not realize what you're drinking and end up having a little too much fun, maybe. <laughs> I think also yeah. it's important awesome. to me that I don't think that cask strength is better. I think that you should, everyone should make the thing that is best for what they are trying to produce. And we really love making cask strength whiskeys, but there are very good lower proof spirits produced. Mm -hmm. And there's parts yeah. of the world that even at cask strength, they're much lower. There's cognacs that are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old that are in the forties because that's just what they yield out of the barrel. Uh, but I do think that you lose a lot of flavor when you're not deliberate about what you're putting in the bottle. And if you have a specific proof to hit, you just, you have to the proof. You, you like, you leave a lot on the table. Uh, and, it's, and it's nice for me working for a company that doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah. Now, um, you, it, will Stellum have like other releases down the road or are we, or are you guys just looking at those as being bourbon, rye, single barrel, single barrel. And that's kind of it, but that's kind of the four and that's, that's it for the time being. So I have to be very careful oh. because barrel and Stellum are, are pretty national brands now. And I, uh, can can only selectively let things out of the bag before I am the I I'm not the arbiter of the lid anymore. Ah. Uh, what I will say is that uh, there's some exciting Stellum stuff coming out this year Ooh. in a small way. Uh, it is true to Stellum in that it is simple and exciting but limited. Uh, and we are really dedicated to Stellum being a pretty simple portfolio. So the things that are exciting about barrel where there's, you know, 57 different finishes on a whiskey released at the same time, it's not going to happen with Stellum. Uh, but 
stellum bourbon is blue, stellum rye is green, and there are other colors in the rainbow. I think that's the that's oh. the that's my core okay. relief. Uh, but but probably not this year. Um, oh. Uh, next we, year, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. What we want to be very year. careful about is we are working on some blends for Stellum that we really like. We don't want to release anything in Stellum that is going to make it seem like an independent bottle or company. Stellum is a, a brand that we're really proud of and we're really dedicated to. And so we are being very deliberate that the exploratory process and the pushing the blending envelope process and the uh, you missed it middle finger type of sales is staying in the barrel universe. And the things that are coming out in Stellum are going to be things that if you like it, it will be available to you. Uh, we don't want Stellum to be a brand that goes in and out. People can't find it's not a, it's not a uh, chasing the Pappy brand. Stellum is a, I'm, I'm tired of Maker's Mark brand. Uh, and so we're being very careful about the things that we release under that label. I, I will uh, say though, you did a good tease that something fun could be coming though. I like that. I like yeah, that. We, can't, we can't help ourselves, but we're trying really hard to keep a muzzle on it, if that makes <laughs> sense. Well, I, I was hopeful. I mean, last time you, you were, were like the third person to know about seagrass. So may, maybe, maybe we can pull something out of you. But, well, but, but I mean, like, yeah, I, I guess it, it is nice because, you know, on the, the barrel side, you know, you have like, I, I just got batch 30 or uh, yeah, batch 30. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that the 30? Yeah. You know, uh, which was wonderful. It's a weird spring or summer, fall type blend. It's the like, first one that we ever used the Wyoming to slid in. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was wild because I got like, part summer, part fall, which was perfect because it came out in like August, you know, like it was, it, it, it was perfect. But I, I like having one that's doing that because with, with barrel to some degree, the downside is, is that once the batches are gone, they're gone. You know, mm -hmm. if you love it, you better go out and buy a bunch of them because they're not going to be around outside of the three, um, you know, dovetail or media and, and seagrass that'll, will kind of stick around. So I, I like though that Stellum is, is one that you can get because I, I went back for some more rye. And I, I, I just had to. And, and we want to be that with Stellum, we want that. And even though we will have a holiday release of Stellum, it won't be, it won't be a thing that can't sort of come back in one iteration or another. But uh, so it's almost like the new year batch of a sense for, for yeah, I kind of, kind of like, that. like a weird, not, weird, not as weird exotic cousin. as that, but yeah, um, <laughs> like a, a distant cousin. <laughs> it'll be uh, Stellum is, is a, a deliberately boring portfolio, if that makes sense. Um, and it's because we want people to identify with what we're trying to say with the brand rather than just the distillate itself. No, that's fair. I mean, I would totally, um, recommend Stellum to anyone who wants like a shelf uh, like drinker or anyone who, who is like actually starting in their bourbon or whiskey journey I would highly recommend it actually just thinking about it one of my, my best friends just asked me like what bourbon or rye I should recommend to her I'm like and I think this will be it because I think it's a little bit different um not like you know like the major distillers um but this is just something different that it could strike conversation and it could lead to more conversation after that first <laughs> strike so yeah. i think i think that's what i'm going to recommend to her is like this um to her friends so cool well, thank you i appreciate that uh, like, like I said, I, I've yet to have anything that I've disliked from, from y'all. And, 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 and I think that's a testament to, to just, you know, Joe, Trip, Nick, everyone there, because you can tell how much effort goes into it because it is hard. It's one thing to make, you know, like you said, barrel or Stellan Bourbon, Stellan Ryer, they're going to be the same. You're going to find them all the time. It's one thing to make that always good. It's another to make the funky finishes of dovetail, Armedia, seagrass, and then, you know, 30 different batches. Now I haven't had all 30, so maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe one I wouldn't have liked. One, one day we're going to do like the craziest <laughs> vertical thing ever. You know, uh, everyone's yeah. going to be passed out. By yeah. like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but but no i i love it all and and uh, i it's i i have nothing else to add to that that's all i gotta say i really appreciate that um and i i think to to joe and nick and trip's credit the innovation is about like is this good enough like we tried a new thing stellum is really hard to get right every time it's a different uh, there's this well mix like, of five sad reality of the beer world in america where like most of the the most technically talented brewers end up working for like Coors or miller or budweiser don't tell me like, that don't tell me that don't well no that. it's just because like <laughs> nailing the exact same thing anywhere in the country at any time that's hard is insanely difficult oh I, i've had i've had buddies tell me like yingling from where i'm from they have a just a brewery up in pottsville and then one down in florida mm-hmm. and they can tell the difference between the two and and i yingling's wow. not as good at that as budweiser is and i i think that like the idea that like if you are a bud person you get a bud heavy anywhere in the country and it does for you what you want it to do is impressive. And I'm not saying that Stellum is like Budweiser culturally. And I'm not saying that, <laughs> that every bottle of Stellum is exactly the same the way that Budweiser might be. But uh, that is a, it's a talent getting it, getting it the same every time. And it's, it's a different flex that has to happen. Uh, and it's one that we worked on for two, we had, we were sitting on the juice and I had to not tell anyone for two years with Stellum, uh, which was tough, especially locked in my parents' house for like half of it It was really difficult. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, Will. Thank you. (laughs) Chris, what are you thinking of, of all these three? What, 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 what stood out to you? And and I don't know, Uh, you just, I uh, I was right. Yeah. I've just been listening to you guys. Now I was really impressed with the drinkability of the bourbon. Um, just how smooth and, you know, I got a lot of corn. It was nice, you know, creamy mouthfeel. So that was, that was very enjoyable. But uh, I think I might, you know, this might be the winner for me. This, uh, this rye, the Stellum rye tonight. It uh, just from the start to finish, from nosing it to drinking it. I mean, I, I loved everything about it. I appreciate you know? that. Thank you. And, and don't get me wrong. The seagrass was good too, but. This, I feel like I could drink all of this right now sitting in front of you guys. So this is dangerous. We'll have to turn dangerous. the recording off if you're going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Very dangerous. But uh, no, the Stellum Rye is fantastic. Very, very good. Hey, what, what, did you go back for something? What did you go back yeah, for? Yeah, I did. I went back to and pour a little bit of the Stellum bourbon to just kind of nose it. And I would agree uh, that Stellum rye is probably going to be my standard shelf life rye right now. Um, mm-hmm. Just FYI, my standard uh, rye is rare breed rye and pin hook rye right now. But truthfully, this, this for $55 rye, I mean, it's really good. I mean, you could drink it by itself or in a cocktail or on mm-hmm. the rocks or whatever. Um, the bourbon is probably my second um, because it's a classic bourbon for $55. Like I was just thinking like, what can I get with $55 that is just like a classic bourbon, like in terms of like all the profiles, but it's not too harsh in the sense of like a lot of Kentucky heat that would uh, turn like new bourbon drinker or whiskey drinkers kind of away from it. And the seagrass is in a class of its own, truthfully. I mean, that's just something that is, I've never had. Like, that's what I like about barrel, I would say. Um, that's just something I've never had. And it's as a bourbon enthusiast or whiskey enthusiast, that's the kind of profile that needs to be on my shelf because there is no other like rye that comes like, as close as seagrass or, or this particular blend is just really interesting. I mean, like and any whiskey enthusiast have to try seagrass because it's so different. I don't see any, like it tastes like a cocktail, like a tropical paradise. Um, it might not be for like, you know, like every day or anything, but it's like, it sits like perfectly in the shelf because it's so different than any other categories that's out there. So I, really, I want to just record that, that and like put it on like Delta planes or something like that. 
<laughs> I, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'll send you A's address so she can get the royalties and, and all. But, <laughs> but, but, but no, like we, we've talked about that with, with especially like Barrel, like the dovetail, the Armedia, and, and now the seagrass. You know, it's, it's, it's the baby of the, of the three. Um, to, to me, those are so fun to bring people that are these quote unquote, they've tried every bourbon, they've tried every rye. You give them that, they're going to say, I've never had that before. And, and it's it's really fun to give someone like that. Now, they may not be the best introductory uh, bourbon or, or rye or anything like that. But, you know, for, for those lovers that say, oh, I've had this, I've had that. Like, you give them those and they're impressed because they're so complex. And, and not to say that the others, like the Stellan bourbon, Stellan rye, don't have some complexity to it. But the, the roller coasters you get on the others are just... A, a said it the best i mean they're just they're, they you need those on your shelf and and i think too to me they're at a good price point because you know i do the give it a try highlights i do different things like that i pay attention a little to the secondary secondary and things like like that and my god you know more and more people are coming in at 200 250 300 yes and and you're yeah. like that's that oh that's okay like I, I've had that, that's okay. But for 90 bucks, 95 bucks, 100, 109. Now I know Barrel has some 200. You know, I know, I know the gray label can get up, up, up there because of the age and so forth. Yeah. But my God, like you can't, and it goes back to what y'all, you said last time, that's what you wanted. You wanted to be that in that sweet spot of that $90, $100 range and be the best at it. And I've told others this that I've had on. I'm not saying that because you're on. I'm saying that because I truly believe it. Like, it's just damn good. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Like, if you follow any of any of you know, D, Chris, A's social media, you will know when they, they pull out stuff again. There's not a whole lot that they pull out again <laughs> from these. Uh, I'll say Breckenridge was one with the rum cask and some others. Uh, yeah. But but barrel has by far, I mean you you name it. They have told all their, their, their friends. That and is all true. Had it. That is true. No, I, and I yeah. like warms my heart. Thank you. And I think that uh, it it's it's really amazing for me professionally. Like I feel that way about the products too. And I am a harsh critic of booze because I care about it so much. Um, and no, thank you for saying that. And, and thank you for it being real. Like, I, I, I hope you wouldn't have me on if you didn't want me on. <laughs> it's kind of... You know, there, there, there was it's, a reason we invited him. fantastic stuff. So, like, this, this, is my, uh, this is my second bottle of the Armida since we last talked. I, uh, wow. The first bottle just disappeared. I don't know what happened. It, <laughs> it, was, it was insanity, you know, but it, it, was, it was just good stuff, man. I love it. All right. And before we wrap up, A, Chris, you got any extra questions before I ask my last one? No, I'm good. Just uh, everyone go get that Stellum rye because that's what I'm going to do and the Stellum bourbon because it's definitely really good. Chris, anything? A, when you pick up your bottles, buy two and just send them to me. (laughs) Will do. All right. Now, my my last question before we, we close out, Will, is what, what's kind of next for both brands? I'm, you talked a little bit about Stellum. You know, you can't say much, but there are more colors in the rainbow. There's red or there's blue for bourbon. There's green for the rye. Although it's a very dark green. I'm not going to lie. It's very dark green. Um, and then, you know, Barrel, obviously you're on batch 30 uh, that just came out. You know, you've got the three that are consistently out. I, I know another gray line kind of came out on the 15 year. Uh, so what's next for, for both of those brands? Uh, so to be quick about it, um, Stellum, there's not a lot that's next. Stellum is uh, very deliberate about its progression as a brand, um, which in some ways is harder because we're just we're not flash in the pan with Stellum in terms of releases. Barrel has the private release whiskey line, which I imagine you guys have had a couple of, and we're just constantly doing new finishes on that. And so there are always 
I think we're up to like 57 different finishes that have been available on the private lease whiskey line at some point. And we're remaking them and increasing other ones. There's a line that I'm so excited about right now, which is uh, finishes of uh, GD Vira, which is a super traditional family owned Barolo producer. We have three different Barolo crew finishes coming out within the barrel wow. whiskey line. Um, so it's Costa de Rose, uh, uh, what are the other two? Um, I was going to say, that's up A's, A, A's ears perked up. Wow, Barolos, one. though. That's yeah, impressive. three different single barrels. vineyard Barolo finishes. Um, wow. Uh, and then we also have some Cognac Park finishes that we're really excited about. The VSOP, XO, and Borderies finish separately. In, uh, and then similarly, the Barrel Craft Spirits line, the Grey Label, which we've done the, the bourbon of and we've done a rye of and we did a 25-year-old whiskey of two years ago in 2018. Uh, there's a uh, whiskey coming out this year in the gray label. And there's also uh, a couple other things in the gray label coming out this year. Um, and then even though it is uh, violating what Jonathan so nicely talked about with our price points, but there's a gold label coming out this well, Ooh. this year as well. Um, and that has to do that. That is uh, some really, really intensive, uh, secondary maturation on stocks that were earmarked for the 15 year old gray label bourbon that happened. Uh, so there's a very small amount of an, an even higher price point and even higher, like smaller allocation bourbon that's coming out. Um, and I'll, I'll stay coy about that, but it'll be out in not too long. Um, barrel by releasing Stellum, it took the pressure off of us where we can just do what we can just do cool stuff with barrel because we have our, we have our line to talk to people about that don't want to hear about a new thing every week. And so with barrel, we can have a new thing every week now. Um, and so with, I guess what's coming is with Stellum, a couple things deliberately and with barrel new things all the time that you can have me on every week. I'll always have new things for you to try. Uh, Good with that. Uh, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Me too. I was gonna say there was a reason why when when I was looking for another flight night, I was like, "Hey, you got Stellum, you got some rye, you got seagrass." I didn't even think about Batch Thirty when it when it came out, but I mean, my goodness, y- y'all are are staying busy over there. We'll have Thirty One. We'll have New Year Bourbon, which has some new states in it this year. Nice, nice. I, we I, are I very just, busy. Okay. Yeah, that's I, awesome. I, I love it. And, and like I said, and, and I mean this truthfully, like anyone that I've let try this has enjoyed it. And uh, they've be- become fans to the point that any they keep asking me when I'm getting more more, more of it because they just want to keep trying it. And I think that's a testament to what y'all do. Well, if you're going to you know preach, just let us know and we'll make sure you have samples of everything. We preachers, then yeah. we're preachers. Yeah, we preachers. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate it. A, Chris, thank you so much. Do you hope everything's going well? Uh, don't forget to check out all of our Whiskey Weeks episodes. We had Chef Awida uh, on last week. We had Heavy Bourbon Dan Kidd on to kick off Whiskey Weeks 2021. Check out all of our episodes and also give a, check out our Give It a Try highlights, our cocktail quickies. And now our Friday five Q and A five questions with some interesting people in the uh, business or that just enjoy what we do as well. That's at hopspirits.com. Uh, check it all out. Check it out. Check us out on all of our social media at Hop Spirits, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, or on YouTube as well. Will, Chris, A, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.